Herbert's Hundred Harem. I know you're not as upset as you pretend to be, Isma notes as Herbert unpacks. It's an important ritual for him. Not only does it make the room his, but it decentralizes a lot of his kit. If someone shows up in the room and has the good sense to get his jacket first, then he needs an answer. Currently, he has a gun under the mattress, a sheathed knife between pillows, and has just finished stashing a laser rifle behind the chair. No, but someone had to provide the comedy to get everyone over the awe. Herbert remarks as he moves to hide a pair of plasma pistols under the sink and behind the toilet. The city is beautiful, and it's exactly the kind of oversized playground that even my least adventurous and excitable wife loves. Putting on the incredulous critic routine kept everyone from wandering off before I could get a proper feel for this false Gotham. The one in the books is a crime-ridden hellscape that for some reason hasn't been burnt to the ground and left to rot. I wanted to be sure it wasn't actually that. And what do you think? Isma asks as she takes the slag thrower he's about to stash and tucks it under the desk for him. From what I can tell, it's the local entertainment. Actual crime is through the floor statistic-wise as you're allowed to do street performances by acting like a maniac in a bright suit. Herbert answers, which is why I accepted going a round or two on camera. Not with a gun, though. It's hard to make those non-lethal. Too many things that can go wrong. Also, can you get me a large amount of tri-tite on short notice? I'll need something to keep some of the locals distracted while we actually hunt. Oh, what exactly are you planning? Yzma asks. She laughs loud and long when he tells her. His introduction into the area is boots first and into the face of a sonier in body armor. It sends her tumbling and he rises up. He's in his own armor, burnt orange, black and dark gray. Only a single eye is visible. Good evening, detective, and good night, he says lowly as he unfolds a battle staff that he unclips from his belt. There are two kinds of comic villains, those with a lot of substance and a little style, and vice versa. Of course, there was a style to substance as well. Most of a fight between two thinking people is psychological. The Sonier charges at him. Sloppy groundwork and weak foundations. This is like dropping Arkham Origins Deathstroke into the Adam West Batman. A complete shift in tone and something no one is ready for. His staff quickly spins her and then is snuck under her chin. He hefts her onto his back in a simple, smooth movement, and she chokes. Perhaps a more worthy opponent will arrive after you. The slight whisper of steel spinning through the air lets him know where the danger is from. He abandons the choke and swats the device down. The thin piece of black metal hits the ground, and he doesn't have to look at it to know it's shaped like a bat. There are muffled cheers from the spectators, which by itself is an entire swarm of vigilante-themed women. Something like this would keep him good and sharp until they started hunting tomorrow and would provide a fair amount of data on Sonier hand-to-hand capabilities. Not to mention would just be a ton of fun to watch later. Return home, child. Your fight is finished. He tells the Sonier with the bruised throat and pointedly does not turn around as a simple step forward has him dodge the next thrown weapon. He only turns when he senses her approach him and it's for his opening attack of a massive swing. She dodges, but not enough as his staff forces her wing to fold and she hits the ground, rolls with the impact and springs at him. The other end of his staff finds itself in her collarbone and carries that momentum over his head with ease, and she unfolds her wings again to turn it into a launch into the air rather than the slam he was aiming for. Improvisation. Good, he states. The trick to this persona is to keep things low, evaluating and calculating. A lot of the boys of the Dauntless are currently clambering to set up an outpost here, and Admiral Cistern agrees. A world full of either high-tier hunters or the logistical experts that support them. Please and thank you. The fact that there was a lot of fun to be had with this clear appreciation of human culture meant that they wanted to get some groundwork established. 
and who better to fit in for the soldiers of Earth than a mercenary persona? She gets some height and throws a trinity of the Batarangs at him. A twirl of his staff deflects the two that are on point. Then he steps to the side to dodge the third which had reversed direction with a touch of the Sonir's axiom. She slams down, but he's already moved to the side. But her arms are up and she catches the staff as she reinforces her wing arms to absorb the blow and stop it entirely. This girl knows what she's doing. He says nothing as he immediately lets the staff go and then kicks at her knee via the side to unbalance her. She topples and he grabs her hand, still wrapped around his staff, and uses it to lever her to the side as he forces the other end against the floor. He then swings around it and his boots meet her mask and she staggers back before stumbling. A glass jaw. Pity. He notes as she staggers upright. The poor girl is clearly unsteady on her feet after the boot to the face. He hides his disappointment. He was looking forward to a good fight. It looks like it's nothing but chaff and wannabes out tonight. Stay down, child. Your fight is finished. The sound of someone landing behind him has him slowly turn to face the next bat. She outright gulps as his single visible eye glares at her from behind his mask. The single point of humanity on him, and it's near visibly dissecting her. He gives his staff a slight twirl and starts to pace. This nervous one he doesn't have to worry about, so he scans the crowds beyond her, using his slow pacing around her to both keep up the intimidating glare and get a good look at everyone. There are about four others that look like they want to jump in. Two of those are in really bad outfits, more akin to pajamas than anything, and the other two have cobbled together gear. You must know that you won't be enough alone, Herbert says, keeping the low, slow enunciation of his voice for both character and intimidation purposes. He then gestures to the more eager-looking Sonier watching. You there. Yes, you. Perhaps all of you? There's a pause for a moment, and then a rush of movement as the four from the audience swoop down at him. His head snaps up to watch them, and he senses movement from the more timid one that showed up first. His left boot meets the top of her head between the points on the mask, and he launches off her and at the swooping Sonier. He uses the staff to lever himself up off of one to bring him into position to drive his knee into the face of another. The girl he slams into goes limp, and he lands with him holding onto her by the collar, both to intimidate the rest and to stop her from slamming her head against the pavement and getting more than the light concussion he just gave. Four, remain. He notes letting down the unconscious Sonier gently but seemingly carelessly. Is he, is he real? One of them asks in fear while backing off. He doesn't answer, merely watching them as he gets ready to move again. There's a rising tension of fear and he takes a step towards them. They outright flinch. Okay, time to break character. Oh my God, come on, girls. Do you know how hard it is to stay in character? Don't tell me you're we're fooled. He demands reaching up and pulling off the helmet. The fact that he still has baby fat around his cheeks has to make this even more surreal. Like a horror movie killer suddenly splitting in half to reveal it was a pair of kids in a coat the whole time. Relax, she's just unconscious. You ready to keep going? The questions get a huge rush of relieved laughter from the audience. They had been increasingly holding their breath as he had just moved with ease. Sweet goddess, kid, you are a scary little tret. Human, actually. I got a stronger-than-average healing coma, and suddenly I have to work to stop my voice from going high-pitched, Herbert answers. That explains a lot. You're, uh, you're a little too good at this. One of the girls in the bat-themed pajamas says reproachfully, If the villain can be knocked over with a stiff breeze, then they weren't much of a villain, were they? Herbert asks with a bright smile. Now then, shall we continue? Yes. The crowd roars and he holds a finger up to his lips. Let the ladies in the ring decide. He announces in a chiding tone. I don't play easy, but I do play fair. Minor axiom usage. 
nothing beyond what was in the comics, games, and cartoons. Didn't he have magic in one of them? I'm going to skip that one. He replies, and the four girls are suddenly looking a lot more encouraged. Now that they know it's some guy in armor and not actually a comic character stepping out of the shadows with murder on the mind, they're a fair bit more relaxed. He puts the helmet and mask back on. Excellent. Let us continue. Did he have to drop his voice back into the growl as he did that? One of the armored ones asks. It's called getting into character. Someone from the crowd calls out. It's one of his girls. You should see him do private stream. He goes from sophisticated to so innocent you'd swear he doesn't know where babies come from. They do not need to be aware of our private life, Amaria, Herbert says in the low tone. He lets the crowd work their own assumptions. After all, no one would expect a cute cosplay routine to be part of an interrogation or infiltration method. Well, how about a public assist? Amaria calls out as she jumps with Axiom and lands next to him. The Yaoya girl is rocking a tight leather outfit with a sword sheathed over her shoulder and a mask over her face. Her hair is back in a tight braid, and if not for the non-human traits, she would be a bang on doppelganger of the sexy ninja assassin. After all, four to one is a little unfair, isn't it, husband? I suppose if you were to join their side, I might have a challenge. He teases her. Even as he hears the sonier he knocked out begin to stir. The blade is blunt, I hope. I couldn't cut a check with the edge on this hunk of metal, Amaria says, drawing her curved blade and taking a ready stance. A cutting edge is for beasts. Excellent, he answers. This is still just a workout coupled with public entertainment. Some poor girl losing a limb would be way too far. He takes a ready stance and twists the staff to allow it to extend and contract a bit more readily. He had kept it very rigid previously, time to really make this toy move. Both he and Amaria allow the Sonier to charge them first. With a flick and a touch of axiom, he sends out part of the staff to slam into face of the first Sonier to come close to him, and he forces the second to block with a punch with his other hand. Amaria's swings are dodged by the two girls she's taking on but has them entirely on the back foot as they try not to get hit by the blunt but still painful blade. The staff is brought around to slam onto the head of the sonier he punched, even as Amaria takes a big step into the defenses of her opponents and stabs hard against the armor, forcing the girl back and bowling her over entirely. Stay down if you wish to live. She orders the Sonier before dodging away from the attack of the other and then bringing her sword up to defend from them. There's a ring of metal on metal as that Sonier is holding her batarangs like double-sided daggers to counter the sword. The Sonier begins to say something and then dives to the side to avoid the one that Herbert just booted hard at her. He walks up to stand beside Amaria as he fully extends his staff and holds it at a ready stance. Amaria takes a similar stance beside him and both would be superheroes look at each other before nodding and charging at them both. It's over in moments. Amaria has been training to be a huntress since she was six, and Herbert went through the full undaunted training plus all the madness Sir Philip and Madame Stepanova could throw at him. The undaunted training alone was enough to put him in the ballpark of a comic book martial artist with Axiom. It was just silly. With the extra training, it was just plain unfair. Perhaps this failure will teach you to hunger for victory, Herbert says enigmatically before throwing down a smoke bomb, grabbing Amaria around the waist and using a grapple launcher to rocket them both out of the area. There's all sorts of applause and laughter after people realize what he just did. Think they enjoyed the show? Herbert asks as he pulls off his mask and helmet, and Amaria does the same for her face mask. She has the biggest smile on her face. I know I did, my goddess, you were fantastic. Do you think you could stick around for a while? We'll pay very well for that kind of showmanship and skill. The sponsor that Herbert had been put in contact with by Arena says, 
I have other duties, but if you'd allow a recruiting office to be set up in the city, then the officer staffing it would certainly be on hand for a bit of advertisement. Herbert replies, and from the excited look on her face, he knows he made the sale. The undaunted are expanding again. 